For the first three years of our Lord's public ministry, our Lord accepts the title of prophet, but not king. As one author says, and I quote, Jesus, who had always been opposed to any public manifestation and who had fled when the people wanted to make him their king, allows himself to be born in triumph today. This week, this holy week, our Lord allows himself to be recognized as a king, but he will reign from his throne and his throne is the cross. During the five weeks of Lent, the emphasis has been, in a certain sense, on us, right? We're concentrating on what we're doing or what we should do. What should we do in an effort to empty ourselves from our selfishness, to empty ourselves from our pride, so that God's grace would have a place in our heart. In other words, we were making ourselves more available to other people, making ourselves open more to love. That's what Lent is all about. It reminds me of what a priest once said, preparing his parishioners for Lent, and he told them, never pick out a penance that's going to be a penance for everybody else. And then he told the story about this man who would smoke. And for Lent, he would give up smoking. But during the whole five weeks, he was miserable and nasty and mean. He became a penance for everybody else around him. And he lost the whole meaning of what Lent was all about. And that is to be able to love more and to be able to love better. During Holy Week, the emphasis is now on God's work as the divine physician in the Paschal mystery. All eyes are on him, or at least they should be. So we should concentrate on how Christ is going to conquer sin and death. At the beginning of our liturgy, we had a procession with palms and this procession has a twofold meaning. First of all, it meant that we were participating in a triumph. Christ is going to win the battle. He always does. But secondly, he was going to win it through suffering and death. So we begin our week carrying our palms as a symbol of triumph, but we may never forget that we must accompany the king to his throne, which is the cross. Whether we realize it or not, we have a real opportunity now more than ever before to accompany Jesus in his passion because his bride, the church, is going through a very serious passion right now as we speak. As one author says, there reached a point when Jesus was surrounded by so much division, so much rancor, so much accusation and betrayal that words could no longer speak. Only his blood could carry his voice and complete his mission. Years ago, St. John Paul II wrote a poem called Stanislaus. It's a poem about St. Stanislaus, the great Polish saint. And this is what he said in that poem. If the word has not converted, it would be blood that converts. And we have always seen that throughout the history of Christianity, right? The blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. St. John Paul II, years ago at the World Youth Day in Toronto, Canada, actually told the young people, prepare for martyrdom. Prepare, prepare for martyrdom. Be willing to die. Be willing to follow Christ all the way in his passion.
And so we are today suffering through a passion in the church. This is so clear in the eyes of Cardinal Sarah when he said this, and I quote, Today the church is living with Christ through the outrages of the passion. The sins of her members come back to her like strikes on the face. The apostles themselves turned tail in the Garden of Olives. They abandoned Christ in his most difficult hour. Yes, there are unfaithful priests, bishops, and even cardinals who fail to observe chastity. But also, and this is very grave, they fail to hold fast to doctrinal truth. They disorient the Christian faithful by their confusing and ambiguous language. They adulterate and falsify the word of God, willing to twist it and bend it to gain the world's approval. They are the Judas Iscariots of our time. End of quote. Yes, we are experiencing a very painful passion in the world today. But what should be our response? Should it be a response of fear and discouragement, which I seem to see all over the place, maybe a response of anger, judgmentalism, whatever it might be? Is it a response like the people who walked away from our Lord in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of St. John when our Lord offered to give himself to them totally in the most holy Eucharist, where people just wouldn't and couldn't believe the truth about our Lord, that he was there to give himself completely to them? Is the response like that of the apostles, who when Jesus was arrested in Gethsemane, they ran for the hills. A lot of times that is our response, and we go and hide and think things will be better if we just ignored them. Is the response to pull out the sword like St. Peter and to try to be a swordsman and to win the call? He wasn't a very good swordsman, was he? He cut off a guy's ear, you know? But anyway, Peter, Peter, he just couldn't get it. That's why I love St. Peter, because he finally did get it. But he couldn't get it at first. He couldn't stand the passion. He couldn't stand the, the, the crucifixion. He wanted nothing to do with it. But it was after Pentecost that we see a tremendous change in Peter to the point that he was down in the streets of Jerusalem preaching Christ crucified. Are we going to respond like Peter and go out there and cut people up to pieces with swords and thinking that that's going to solve the problem? We know what our Lord said to him about that. Put your sword away. Maybe we need to put our swords away, too. We see Jesus was still loving from the cross. He prayed, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, instead of condemning them. He told the good thief, you will be with me today in paradise. Could you ever hear more sweet words than that? And after he died, his love was still working in the heart of the centurion who recognized him as his Lord and his God. Or maybe our response should be that like Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Mary Magdalene and St. John, as they gaze upon the truth, as much as it hurt, they gazed upon the truth and they embraced it. They loved it with courage and commitment. Perhaps maybe we had a lousy Lent. 
but we can make up for it by having a superb Holy Week. You know, today I'm going to challenge everybody. You know, our Lord gives us 168 hours a week. He's so generous, isn't he? 168 hours a week. I'm going to challenge everybody this week. What about giving him 10 hours? Give him 10 hours of that 168 hours this week. There will be ample opportunity to give back to our Lord some of our time. And we have been really blessed here in Kentucky because the University of Kentucky was defeated. Our Lord allowed that. Our Lord allowed that and gave us the opportunity to have less distractions during Holy Week. We don't even have to think about college basketball this week. We can think about what is most important, and that is going to heaven someday. <laughs> There's nothing more important than that. Here at the Chapel of Divine Mercy, we will have Mass Monday through Wednesday at 7.30 in the morning. Maybe part of your passion this week can be getting up early if you like to sleep in and say, you know what, it's Holy Week. I'm going to go and get fed by our Lord. Yeah, it's 7.30, but I, I, with the Lord's grace, I can do it. Thursday evening at 7 o'clock, we will have the Mass of the Lord's Supper and then adoration in the, um, at the Altar of Repose in Roseanne Hall until 11 o'clock Thursday night. There's lots of opportunities, right? Lots of opportunities. Friday afternoon, 3 o'clock, veneration of the cross and Holy Communion. Our church, our chapel here, will be open every day, um, all day, right up until the evening, 7 or 8 o'clock at night. If you want to come in and spend some quiet time with the Lord and, and give him your love, your time, your patience, your gratitude for everything that he has done for you. Maybe confession would be a great thing to do this week. We will have confession available every evening, Monday through Friday, from 2 o'clock no, not from 2 o'clock, from 6 o'clock to 7 in the evening. But if you come in here and keep our priests busy, we'll stay in the confessional till midnight. If you're willing to stay in church that long, right? Maybe you just want to come in here and spend some quiet time. That's so important. It's so sad when Jesus had his three disciples there in the Garden of Gethsemane and all they wanted to do was sleep. I know they were, they were exhausted. I know that. But man, if they would have just spent a little bit of extra time with our Lord, maybe things would have been different. And you might object and say, well, Father, it's inconvenient. I work all day. I'm tired. I think our Lord was pretty tired when he was carrying that cross on the road to Calvary. I think it was pretty inconvenient for him to shed every drop of his blood on that holy hill. Yes, it was inconvenient, but he was willing to do that for you and for me. How much do I want to be inconvenienced for him this week. So the challenge is still the same. If you can't make it to church, spend some time at home in a quiet room reading sacred scripture. Catch the services on EWTN. But really put the effort in to have this be the greatest holy week that you have ever had. There have, cannot be any excuses now. We can't be fence-sitters. Things are at a critical point in the world right now. No more fence-sitting. Make a commitment that this is the most important thing that I will do this year. Are we ready to accompany him to Calvary? 
God bless you.